there so welcome everyone uh, uh, today we are having net freedom foundations discussion on covid surveillance and privacy in india uh, we have with us uh, siddharth deep of uh, freedom foundation professor prashish panar of the confinement at iit delhi and we have uttara ane i'm saying that uh, who's a phd scholar at the iit bombay uh, center for policy and uh so be, to set the context right uh today is may day labor day and we are facing this issue of a constant push of apps uh by the government and as well as by different companies who are pushing the aarogya setu app to any individual and employee in their office that are able to uh let people Works. so an employee can't attend their offices without it 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 could be doctors government employees or the swiggy deliveries or delivery boys so uh it's important that we discuss some of these issues the as technology is becoming ubiquitous mandatory even though it's being stated voluntary uh there are different different uh, ways this is happening. uh we will start off with siddharth who's going to uh, tell us walk through us what iff has been doing with their work on documenting the surveillance sites of the nature of the technology is being put right now siddharth okay Th- thanks uh, thanks rinivas so just to give you a sense of exactly the nature of iff work uh, and i hope i'm audible for the entire audience who joined uh is uh, so initially when uh, the corona virus sort of started taking speed within india uh, one of the initial responses that we saw from states like karnataka and punjab was the publishing of quarantine lists those lists contain details for instance people's name their address their travel history uh, and even their pin codes and through that we also got uh, wind and reports of the fact that people were being uh, uh, being ostracized within their communities either them or their friends and family or the fact that they were being denied access to essential items or in certain circumstances even getting ev- eviction notices from their rented accommodation given that that was the case and it was a clear violation of the right to privacy when we look at it from the perspective of uh uh the supreme court's judgment in august 2017 we wrote to the central government to quickly issue a advisory that state governments should refrain from such cases where they re- uh, release directly personal information uh, of individuals uh luckily the government did respond and did issue an advisory that states should re- refrain from these practices but what we've noticed is they, uh, there are still instances where quarantine lists or uh, similar sort of lists are being published within the public domain now while these are less sophisticated instances of government action interacting with people's privacy we've also we noticed that there were more sophisticated attempts as well through let's say the mapping of people's cell phone records matched of uh, uh, signals pinging off uh, cell phone towers for instance or the development of specific apps at the state level then we noticed that certain states were using either drone drones or facial recognition to also complement their surveillance activities to ensure people were adhering to either the lockdown or co- uh, geo- uh, lockdown or quarantine directives and so on and then of course we got wind that you know uh the government the central government is de- developing a contact tracing app which was initially in the avatar of the corona kavach app which was uh put out for download for a couple of days then rolled rolled back and then of course the arogya setu app was launched on april 2nd in that time period we noticed that uh, all of this was happening in a rather fast manner and to and there was an appreciation within iff that this interacts with people's civil liberties and their right to informational privacy so it, it became apparent to us very quickly that we need to study the subject and have a nuanced position on how to ensure that should a government use technology to respond to the public health crisis which is the coronavirus it still is in a manner which is consistent with the rule of law 
and nevertheless respects uh, people's informational privacy and can essentially hold the central uh, the central government or state governments accountable which is why we developed a comprehensive working paper on the subject uh uh where where we've studied both domestic deployments of technology and international deployments of uh, uh whether it's uh, location surveillance app based surveillance etc and we've studied international human rights related literature as well to try and figure out a way forward for countries like india uh the the findings i will get to in a bit but since the publication of this report on april 13th uh, there have been certain changes made to the privacy policy of india's arogya setu app as well and of course uh, since then we've gotten uh, uh, multiple reports of, of the fact that uh, as uh, uh, srinivas earlier hint uh, alluded to that uh, technology platforms were uh, mandating gig workers to install download and install and use the arogya setu setu app uh, while administ administering deliveries we've received similar reports that in government hospitals doctors are be doctors and no nurses and healthcare professionals are also being required to download and install the app and use it similarly there was a notification yesterday that public sector people working within the public sector have to use the app and therefore because it's labor day today we have come out with a we we have come out with a joint statement uh, to, to be sent to not only the prime minister's office but also to the labor ministry the health ministry and the it ministry that uh, any that, to issue a clarification that the arogya setu app is not man mandatory and uh, or cannot be made man mandatory and if done so that is uh, incompatible with people's right to privacy now coming to the actual deployment of these technologies and sort of uh, integrating my anal our analysis in the working paper to you know reasonable restrictions to people's right uh, what we first must understand is that in 2017 when the supreme court recognized the right to privacy as a part of india's fundamental rights it no, it contemplates uh, restrictions to that right when responding to you know epidemics or public health crises and so on and so forth it says that a government uh, the court very clearly says that a government can use health records and related information to respect, respond to public health crises but nevertheless there is an onus for them to ensure the anonymity of people's personal health records and related information and it must never uh, must also be administered under a lawful legal regime and must satisfy thresholds of ne necessity and proportionality so when you look at that three part test the first step is anything that the government does should be under the framework of a lawful uh, law a legal regime or a lawful basis now the government of india would argue and even state governments would argue that it's either in the form of let's say your information technology act but if you just closely study the the limited data protection and privacy provisions within the information technology act they are not applicable to the government of india they are only applicable to private sector so there there is an instance where there is no accountability as such when it use, uh, comes to government usage of personal health records under the it act then if we even get into a more specific domain which is health related frameworks uh, if we look at uh, the Med medical council of india's binding code of eth ethics they are again silent on the treatment of health data and related information once it is disclosed to government similarly when it comes to uh, the electronic health record standards again while there are certain specificities with respect to anonymization uh, uh, for actual accountability it links uh, links the framework back to the it act and that again doesn't or is not capable of holding the government of india accountable so in such a scenario what we notice is there's a clear legal va vacuum where there is no lawful regime that can hold or tell a government that these are the instances where you can use health records or other technology data points to respond to a public health crisis and that in itself creates a unique disadvantage through which india india is responding to this crisis the 
the second step of the three part process is necessity now most governments will just say that look responding to a public health crisis in itself is enough for them to justify the use of technology to respond to the corona virus whether it's in the form of a contact tracing app like the arogya setu app or any other mode but the reality is that there is ample literature now which is coming out in uh, or has even come out in the past as well that talks about the fact that when you look at necessity you need to have a second layer of analysis that second layer of analysis is the fact that you need to justify that any technological system that you're deploying is an effective system which responds to the public health crisis itself because of the fact that you know when when you're using these systems they interact with people's civil liberties the demonstration of effectiveness is imperative now to show exactly how it's uh, translating let's say in jurisdictions like europe to ensure that any deployment of a contact tracing solution is consistent with the right to privacy there the european parliament is already thinking about mandating upon european states the need to establish a proof of concept a proof of concept to show that through uh uh statistically relevant models the fact that if i deploy this technology in this manner and in uh, under these conditions this is how it will be effective in responding to the public health crisis itself now that is something that has been, uh, that has been completely overlooked in the indian context is uh, so therefore it uh, uh and and the indian context is also uh uh handicapped by the fact that the government of india has not been very tra- transparent in the development of an app like arogya setu so all that we have to go by is its privacy policy its terms of service and then a periodic referral to the front end of the app given that firstly there is no uh publication of the underlying source code of the arogya setu app secondly researchers are forbidden from reverse engineering the app thirdly unlike other countries or other efforts to build contact tracing solutions there are no uh, there is no like comprehensive portal which can tell you exactly what the app is doing what is the information that it's collecting how it's using it whether it's stored locally or exported to to a, uh, to what extent is it exported to an external server you look at the uh, t- uh, the the terms of service and it doesn't even mention or the privacy policy it doesn't even mention if you know which government departments are actually accessing the app so there are a suite of issues that we've sort of captured in our working paper itself uh and uh, when it comes to its failure to uh, address a justification under the necessity standard and finally uh, when we look at proportionality itself so proportionality has to be viewed through a few different lenses one is there needs to be an adherence to the purpose limitation principle what is the purpose limitation principle it has to uh, one is that you have to establish that it is uh, that these systems are being used for a singular specifiable purpose now when you look at both the terms of service and the the privacy policy of the arogya setu app there is enough vagueness in the language for it to be repurposed for greater or more expansive capabilities that's also corroborated by our observation that a day after the app was uh, available over uh, for download uh, the government of india set up a a a a committee which was headed by uh, niti ayog the principal scientific advisor the electronics and it ministry the department of telecom and tri so that's clearly uh, uh, alluding to the fact that the government is looking to expand capabilities of the app or repurpose it we've also seen that subsequent to our uh, white paper uh, our working paper being published through the fact that uh, uh, the app now has capabilities of being an e pass system the fact that now just a, a day or two ago media nama came out with a story about how greater capabilities have been introduced into the front end of the app and so on and so forth that's one then you co- come to the fact that uh, when you look at the actual data which is being collected by the app there is a principle of data minimization that these app or at least technologists across the world are trying to uh, uh, to wrestle with when it comes to contact tracing some people are talking about solely going down the gps route 
some people are to- talking about solely going down the the bluetooth route uh but in the case of the arogya setu app it combines both and the justification provided for combining both is not apparent if you scan either the terms of service or the privacy policy similarly when there is a self identification test right at the beginning of the app it collects about eight or nine data points such as your name your age your sex your uh, i think your uh, address whether you uh, initially it also had a question about whether you're a smoker or not and information related to your travel history for instance so it collects a lot of information and then exports it to a central server now a lot of uh, there's a big debate going on in europe whether uh, how can we minimize the ability of a government app to export or collect people's information and transfer transfer it to an external server and ideally keep everything on people's devices the reason behind that is is that once you start creating an external system the uh, that's when the risk of permanent architectures of surveillance become a reality so that in itself is something that the government of india is already doing that's not to say that that is their intent but the design of the app and the way that it functions and the institution suggests that the incentives are aligned towards not keeping this a temporary sort of response to corona virus itself but something which could uh, mutate into something which is more permanent in nature and incentives are a big thing in terms of in creating the right sort of checks and balances where you can use technology to respond to a part- particular outbreak yet if it's not working you can roll it back or once its purpose has been satisfied you can roll it back uh and fi- uh, what we've also noticed is in the institution design itself while other governments are giving the primary responsibility to use these technological system to public health authorities the role of public health authorities in india is minimal at best if you look at just the constitution of committees and who have been driving the development of the system and the fact that the arogya setu app as i mentioned earlier does not uh, does not refer to the exact departments within the government of india who will uh, who have access to these databases which are of course centralized in nature there are also reports that the arogya setu database which is maintained by the national informatics center is already being integrated with uh, you know other government databases like the integrated Sur- uh, disease surveillance program database or other databases with respect to people who have traveled recently back into the country so uh, when you start enmeshing these databases together uh, there is a ton of literature which suggests that it becomes a lot harder to delete it at a later stage we have already seen that with india's experience with aadhar where aadhar has been seeded into multiple other databases and that makes it a lot harder to uh, untangle that database and then destroy it or roll it back and so on and so forth another challenge with the way that the government of india has been going about it is is there is no independent oversight mechanism that is a key uh, core component of uh, even what the supreme court uh, talks about in terms of reasonable restrictions to the right to privacy what i mean by that is you need an independent oversight mechanism to be able to hold government activity with respect to these practices accountable the reason is that when you have let's say that oversight mechanism which comprises people from let's say the judiciary maybe some either other people from the legal community civil society etc it it sort of diversifies the actors at play and if you don't do that then the natural instinct of any government regardless of political leanings will be towards trying to access as much information about its citizens as possible what you need is the right kind of institutional mechanisms to have the right checks and balances so here what we have suggested is the fact that you need to first explicitly mentioned that the arogya setu app has defined sunset periods of review so let's say after let uh, after every 3 months there is a that oversight mechanism can review whether the arogya setu app is let's say being successful in terms of the public health response if it is then to what extent and if it is not then there should be an override function where you can just kill the entire program itself 
and also on top of that what you need is an assurance that these systems will not be used for law enforcement purposes or for the the enforcement of quarantine directives and so on we've studied a bunch of different global models throughout uh, in our working paper in fact we're updating our working paper which we will eventually share with government all the relevant government departments early next week uh, we've particularly done a case study of the arogya setu app as it stood prior to april 13th uh singapore's trace together app which is better than what india has done on some level but it has its own privacy concerns as well which we've highlighted in the working paper and we've also studied uh the massachusetts institute of, of Te- uh, technologies private kit safe paths app as well well that is promising on some level because it uh, uh looks at a decentralized structure of using gps which which uh, sort of may be more inclusive given that not a, a significant part of india does not have bluetooth enabled smartphones so that's an interesting model to look at from an effectiveness and inclusivity perspective but what we've noticed is is that if you were to use that model there are several issues with respect to holding let's say an institution like mit accountable when it shares or creates an underlying infrastructure for governments to use so for instance how does an mit hold governments accountable that's something that we flagged as a concern uh, also the app or the private kit safe path protocol does not have its own uh, pri- uh, project specific privacy policy and it also uh, creates certain concerns with respect to it outlasting the purpose itself because they've talked about how maybe the system can be repurposed for general monitoring of human behavior during public health outbreaks and so on and disease outbreaks and so on and so forth and we've also de- dedicated an entire chapter to the google apple contact tracing or exposure notification announcement as well and we've highlighted certain concerns with respect to uh, how do they hold governments accountable with respect to surveillance capitalism and with respect to uh, issues of competition and conflicts of interest i'll stop here for the time being and let other people uh, contribute professor banerji hi uh, am i audible uh, yes thank goodness i was facing problems with uh, with the connection okay thanks for inviting me um, um, so i uh, will start with the caveat that i am not a specialist uh, in this business at all uh, so what i'll talk on will depend uh, will be primarily based on my common sense as a computer scientist as a prax- practicing computer scientist for a while uh, <clears throat> so i have never worked on bluetooth and stuff like that so um you know so to look at the app uh, it primarily um, you know the objective of the app is contact tracing there's been some talk about geofencing for enforcing quarantine and so on and so forth and some of these apps have also tried epidemiological modeling you know to to figure out how infection spread and so on and so forth so what i'll do is that i'll uh, first try to cover the basic principles uh, under which uh, the engineering principles under which these apps may work and then i'll spend some time on uh, on the utility versus privacy debate uh, so i'll uh, first talk about utility and then i'll talk about privacy so the basic uh, technology is uh, based on two things uh, most uh, most talked about thing is location uh, location with uh, gps so gps works with triangulation from satellites uh, indoor and uh, the accuracy ranges from a few meters to a few tens of meters uh, outdoors uh, and uh, it is completely unreliable in the vertical dimension so you can uh, you probably have only 40 50 meters resolution in the vertical dimension uh it it does not work very well in uh, high rise buildings for example if you have run in new york uh, with a with a garmin watch you will find that your route is completely off uh, because of the tall buildings out there um and it is completely unreliable in those so if you are in this building it can easily say that you are in the next building so it can work with some kind of a rubber banding over time like it does in google maps but um, 
rubber banding requires uh, manual marking of certain things. So without any rubber banding, uh, the geolocation is up to a few tens of meters. And uh, if you're in one building, you can e it can easily say that you're in the next one. So, so that's how unreliable GPS will be for location. Cellular data is has even lower resolution. So um, the resolution can be 50 meters or, or worse. Um, so those are the two basic location technologies that you can use. Uh, Many of these apps talk about proximity um, using uh, Bluetooth. Uh, so it is technically called low energy Bluetooth or BLE. And the way it works is that, that uh, a device transmits a low energy radio beacon uh, intermittently. Uh, so this transmission is isotropic. It's not directional, which means that it transmits uh, equally in all directions in the entire 360 degree uh, solid angle. And uh, the other uh, device, a listening device, picks it up in a certain time slot. And uh, once the two devices establish a Bluetooth communication, uh, the distance is estimated based on the strength of the received signals and the send signal. So, so you there's a formula that translates the signal strength to a distance estimate. So. Uh, now, the difficulty with this is that, that if you transmit too frequently, uh, the battery will dry out in, a, in Bluetooth. So the transmission will have to be periodic. And the transmission frequency will determine uh, your accuracy of contact tracing. So uh, if you transmit, say, once in 10 minutes, um, you will be able to find out proximity only once in 10 minutes. So, so uh, and what is the right? Uh, transmission frequency for contact tracing uh, is unclear right so there is uh, there is no theory that i have seen that to 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 um, to determine spread of infection what should be the right frequency of uh, of, of transmission so um, so a time window threshold is sort of indeterminate and they are arbitrarily set to 10 minutes 15 minutes 5 minutes and so on and so forth and your battery drain out determines on the on the intermittent frequency. So those are the two two basic um, technologies that one can use. Uh, and uh, so the question, the first question that comes to mind is in the utility versus privacy debate is the utility. So utility of of of, of contact tracing essentially will depend on the reliability of contact tracing. So if I understand correctly, I'm not a virologist, but uh, the infection sp uh, spreads in two different ways. One is a direct inhalation of the droplets uh, uh, in the aerosol form. And uh, you require to be you require to be within a distance of two meters of an infected person to get a sufficient virus load uh, from the aerosol. And this is a direct spread of infection. And the second mode of spread of infection is some inadvertent pickup from a contaminated surface. So somebody's um, uh, sputum or, uh, or sneeze droplets can um, spread on a table or a hard surface, and you can pick it up with your fingers as a second mode of, uh, of, of, of contamination. Now, uh, the way I can figure out the second mode is completely inaccessible to either GPS or Bluetooth. You cannot do anything about the about the second mode. There is no reliable model by which the second mode uh, can be determined that whether a person is picking it up from a surface or a table. So you have to associate a certain risk of if you are in close proximity, what is the probability that you have picked up from a, with your fingers? Now, GPS resolution is definitely not enough for the first, you know, for the two meter resolution, especially in dense settings. So, if there are only two people in a 20 meter uh, radius always, and uh, if one of them gets infected and the other picks up, then you know the causal link of the infection spread. Uh, but if there are 10 people out there, for example, and they mingle around in a 40 meter radius in, in various ways, then the attribution of who picked up inf uh, infection from whom is simply not possible with GPS because GPS does not work at a lower than two millimeter, uh, two meter resolution. So um, GPS um, will be quite unreliable for contact tracing, in my opinion. 
Uh, now comes Bluetooth proximity. Now, Bluetooth proximity can uh, perhaps work for the first case, uh, for the direct aerosol pickup. It definitely doesn't uh, work for the picking up from contaminated surface because um, you know one person may leave uh, the infection on a, on, a, on a surface, and I'm told that it can stay there for 12 hours before the second person can pick it up. So Bluetooth proximity does not help there at all. Um, now, whether you use Bluetooth or GPS, uh, the proximity calculation, the path intersection, will require some centralized aggregation for multiple cell phones. Uh, none of the cell phones are powerful enough to do the intersection computations always. So the intersection computation cannot be um, computed uh, in a reliable manner in a distributed fashion on, on cell phones. This is something that is unlikely to scale, and nobody does that. So everybody uses a centralized centralized server. And uh, ideally, you should be computing path intersections uh, with either GPS or uh, Bluetooth, but you should, uh, which, which most people do. Uh, but you should also be computing intersection of space-time volume, given that you can pick it up from surfaces. So for example, if my path crosses yours in just in space at a point time, at a point in time, that's not enough because I can pass a spot 12 hours after you have passed and still pick up the infection. So ideally, one should compute a space-time volume intersection. And um, whether any of these apps contemplate doing that is not, not very clear. To be able to do space-time volume intersection, one will require persistent IDs uh, because my ID will have to persist for over a certain temporal duration. Uh, if you can do a space-time volume intersection at all. So with uh, rotating IDs or dynamic IDs, this will become uh, sort of harder to do. So there, it appears to me that there's a leap of faith from geocolocation or Bluetooth radio proximity to infection risk. You know, so what is the theory that says that if I am in Bluetooth contact uh, with somebody else's phone, I have a chance of passing, what are my probability of passing an infection to the other person uh, is not at all clear to me. To me, it appears that uh, this has to be rooted in theories in biology, physics, and probability theory. And I, for one, have not seen any white paper or any document uh, that says that uh, you know how Bluetooth proximity translates to a risk, an infection risk model at all. Um, so, you know, so the assumption that every Bluetooth proximity will transform to an infection risk seems untenable because my virology friends told, tell me that if I am in a 10 minute conversation contact with a infected person from a distance of one meter, then the chances of infection spread, he would think, would be less than one person. And uh, uh, if that is the case, then there will be just too many false positives with Bluetooth um, proximity for it to be useful at all. So um, you know, any measurement instrument, and in this case, this is a risk measurement instrument, uh, must have an associated error model. So, um, so a risk instrument is, is a sort of elementary engineering principle. We teach this in first and second year that never measure anything and declare a measurement unless you can say that what's the error in the measurement. You know, this, this is called the principle of least count. So if you are saying that there's a certain risk of infection spread, it's your responsibility to also say that what is the probability of a false positive and what is the probability of a false negative? Uh, and in none of the apps, uh, not only Arugya Setu, but uh, you know, the two MIT apps, the, the Singapore one, I don't see anything even uh, you know that can be called even a semblance of an error model. Uh, so, uh, so the possibility of too many false positives and too many false negatives uh, exist. And given this situation, I would say that the utility is extremely doubtful. Uh, and uh, it is not at all clear to me that the app will do anything that uh, a simple local community cannot do much more effectively. Uh, so. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that the utility, there can be no utility in it, but the utility has to be established. And I have not seen any study that has established the utility at all.
Uh, so uh, we have to keep our mind open. But the first way to establish the utility is at least come up with a theory paper. You know, come up with a theory white paper to say that why it should work under what principles, and then do a pilot to evaluate whether it works at all. So all of that is missing, and uh, without that, trusting it on an unsuspecting population, uh, I think is uh, is a little uncalled for. Um, you know, given the situation, if I have to come to the utility versus privacy debate at all, I have to assume that the utility is there. Because uh, if there is no utility, anything you know that violates privacy is unacceptable. So um, the utility versus privacy debate makes sense only if we assume utility. So for the time being, let's say that there is utility. And um, then let's ask the question that what are the privacy issues out there? Um, so you know, just the other day, I heard uh, you know uh, a group of lawyers in a in a webinar like this, and I think one of them mentioned uh, that privacy is a luxury right. Uh, it's a right, but it's a luxury right. And uh, of course, there were indignant protests from several others. Uh, this is not a computer science view. Computer science has never ever taken privacy to be a luxury right. In fact, privacy protection is considered to be paramount. And computer science has over 30 years of privacy research. You know, we have about at least 10, 10 or a dozen uh, frontline journals um, that deal just with privacy. There must have been at least 5,000 PhDs on privacy. And, uh, you know, there have been privacy papers from 1970s. So to, to say that uh, an application should not uh, take care of privacy is not uh, definitely not the mainstream computer science view. And um, if I take a computer science view, I think that um, you know, computer science uh, will probably take a s more stringent view of the utility versus privacy trade-off, and uh, than than uh, than law will. And I think that the question that has been asked in computer science most frequently is why a trade-off at all? You know, uh, if there is utility, uh, the, if the onus is on the designer to show that there is a need for a trade-off. Uh, in fact, computer science would like to believe that you could have both utility and privacy and complete privacy for uh, for most situations. So if you are saying that we are doing it in an emergency and there has to be a trade-off, uh, the owner should be on the designer to show that the trade-off is necessary and a complete privacy protection with technology is not possible. And uh, I think, uh, you know, if I hold this app to scrutiny, I think most of them will turn out to be bad computer science uh, because uh, they have come up with designs without conclusively establishing that uh, trade-off is necessary at all. In fact, uh, you know, uh, so when two devices exchange information, like two cell phones do, uh, the privacy protection principles uh, were established even before cell phones came into uh, use. You know, there's a seminal paper by David Chom in 1984 uh, that showed us how two devices can exchange information without compromising privacy at all. And uh, uh, that was based on principles of virtual identities, uh, which most of these uh, contact tracing apps seem to be using. Uh, but um, unfortunately, they are not using it uh, even to the fullest extent in which Chom outlined they should be used in 1984. So that is uh, somewhat surprising. Um, so if I have to look at the, uh, the the privacy protection in several apps, you know, I'll just restrict myself to Bluetooth. I won't even talk about GPS because uh, it is well known in computer science that with location, no privacy preservation is possible um, because it requires only five measurements of my daily movements to exactly identify me. There is there is apparently only one individual in the whole world who will exhibit a certain movement pattern which is exactly mine. For example, you know, I live in a certain place within IIT. My office is in a certain location, and uh, I visit a few places. So this is almost a biometric. Um, and if you make a signature out of my movement, daily movement patterns. 
you can identify me with the extremely high probability and there have been several papers to show this so with geolocation privacy preservation um, will be extremely hard if the geolocation is made public uh, so the only way privacy preservation is possible with geolocation is the strict access control that who can access the the geo tracking information uh, the situation is a little different with uh, proximity sensing and uh, uh, the proximity sensing happens in two ways. Everybody downloads the uh, contact tracing apps, and uh, suppose they are A and B. So A and B both generate contact tokens, uh, which rotate over time in most cases, and they cannot be used to reveal the identity directly or track over time. Now, um, now this is most of these apps use dynamic IDs um, that change very frequently, a matter of 10 minutes or 15 minutes. In fact, the original BLE protocol also changes identity. I don't like over what is the time duration, but the identities keep changing. Um, the identities don't change in Arabic. The identity is uh, static. Uh, they don't use dynamic IDs, and they're pretty static. And once there's static, uh, uh, I think privacy preservation is almost impossible. Uh, there can be a variety of privacy attacks uh, under auxiliary information that can come about, all well known in computer science literature. Uh, and uh, any determined user should be able to identify uh, fairly easily with access to the information. Now, uh, if the IDs rotate, uh, then when uh, two people meet, A and B, they exchange this contact tokens, this randomized contact over Bluetooth. And both A and B keep a list of all the received and all the sent tokens with them in their cell phones. And uh, this is what happens in the MIT apps or the, the proposal of uh, Google and uh, Apple that these exchange, these randomized exchange tokens, uh, these randomized virtual IDs are maintained locally on the on the cell phones. Now, if B is later diagnosed with the disease, then B submits the tokens uh, to, an, uh, to a server. Uh, for Google and Apple, that server is untrusted. For the Singapore app, the server has to be trusted. For Arabu Setu, the server is completely trusted. Uh, so uh, whatever the case may be, the, the infected person submits the tokens to a, to a, to a server, centralized server. Uh, they can either upload the list of all transmitted tokens or received tokens or both. Um, so in case of the Apple and Google proposal, both are transmitted. Uh, but in some of the proposals that I've seen, only the sent tokens are transmitted. Um, and uh, the list of tokens from the users diagnosed with the disease uh, is maintained in the private database to user can either submit queries or published in public list so the users can uh, check for intersections on their own device right uh, so there are two models in which uh, the, the first model is the users who uh, voluntarily upload and others users uh, they check it voluntarily and there is no central authority that ever gets to know who is infected and in some models uh, a central authority is also alerted about the, about the infected person. Now, in this model, among the various apps that uh, that one can see, uh, you know, what are the attacks on these things? There are two kinds of it. There are four. There are um, primarily two, but but um, there are two other kind of secondary attacks that are also pos uh, possible. So, first is that who who gets to know the infection status? Uh, so, so if the if the send tokens are exposed by the users um, completely, uh, you know, so whatever tokens you have sent is is exposed, then anybody who has seen the tokens and have maintained a list at the, the, the timestamp of that the uh, uh, at which they have seen the tokens can construct an identity fairly easily. So the infection status becomes visible to. Uh, so B's infection station can easily be vis become visible to A if A has also kept a timestamp with each of the tokens. So A has to know that I met this person at such and such a time. And uh, so when the tokens become public, she can match the time and figure out that who is the person who, is, who has got infected because of which I'm getting the alarm. So this is, uh, this is a bit of a problem in the vigilante situation, especially in India when the stigma of the disease is spreading faster than the disease itself. Uh, uh, I am not sure that exposing the infection source is such a great idea. 
but uh, there can be easy attacks uh, if you if you uh, if you expose the send tokens to find this out. Uh, second is the infection status determination by the server itself. Uh, so if the server sees all the send tokens uh, and the receive tokens, then the server can determine uh, the identity of the of the infection spreader. So in case of Aragusetu, this is not a problem at all because uh, when you register, you give them their phone and your names. So the server can always determine that who is the infection spreader. But in some of these applications, um, some of the other applications, especially in MIT, there at least has been an attempt to prevent the server and the central authority from determining that who is the infection spreader. So they can just alert users, but they cannot figure out that who has spread the infection. Um, the server can also construct a social graph. You know, If they see the sent and received tokens of the infected person, then at least for the infected person, they can reconstruct the social graph of who are the other people they came in contact with. And this is, again, a, again, a massive privacy risk. And um, finally, there can be a false claim by the user. So for example, if I want to, uh, if I want to uh, you know, put some of my colleagues whom I don't like in quarantine, all I have to say is declare myself as infected. and. Uh, uh, and everybody who has come in my contact will be forced to go into quarantine, so I can play true hunt out there. And uh, there has to be protection against these false claims. Um, I think that Aragya Setu doesn't have this problem because uh, this is verified. You know that when I when I declare myself as infected, somebody verifies this claim. So, uh, for example, if I look at the Singapore app, the Singapore app. Uh, the infection status by the user is non-determinable. By the server is uh, obviously determinable because it is a centralized server, trusted server. There is no protection against the social graph creation, but uh, there's a protection against the false positive of the user. Uh, methods like private kit uh, and uh, pact of MIT uh, or the or the Apple and Google. Uh, they don't give any protection to infection status discovery by either user or the server. Uh, both are possible under you know, ordinary due diligence and some determined attack. Uh, they give protections against false positives. Uh, so the so the protection against the determination of user identity by other users or the server are, is very weakly implemented, at least from the initial proposal. There is a recent uh, proposal called Epion. Uh, which has just come up on 28 uh, by a group in Berkeley and uh, and one of my friends in uh, Montreal. And EPUN seems to be a completely privacy-preserving contract tracing app. Uh, so they're just con concentrated on the privacy preserving and seems to have done a fairly good job. So I, at uh, the first reading, could not find any vulnerability of the paper. And uh, so in a computer science sense, it appears that a completely privacy preserving contact tracing is completely possible, uh, provided you have strict access control at the server and you don't leak information at the server. So in case of Varugya Setu, it is not at all clear that what kind of access control policy they have. And access control policy without a regulatory oversight has no meaning. So our, the, the server security is a, is a, is a big concern, uh, concern out there. So just before finishing, uh, I'll, uh, just before finishing, I'd like to say that this, you know, all this uh, seems to suggest some kind of a techno determinism to me. You know, uh, so uh, uh, it's a, you know, do something just because you have to do something. Uh, without adequate thoughtfulness. Uh, uh, there are two things that worry me, you know, that the utility is not clearly established and uh, it is so ad hoc, it sort of looks like a voodoo science. And second thing that, um, you know, if you say that you are implementing privacy, you are, you are taking care of privacy, how can you do so so poorly? How can you do with a static ID? and? Uh, I mean, this is not a criticism against Aragya Setu, but against Google and Apple. I mean, I think that design looks childish to me, and uh, it doesn't take care of established computer science wisdom of 30 years. And uh, uh, 
so it um, it looks like that lack of due diligence is is completely shocking and um, this techno determinism has some risks for example it um, prevents looking for simple such simpler solutions so like um, like kerala you know they didn't do any of this and simple community building uh, could uh, not only do contract tracing but uh, you know their doubling time has gone to some 70 or 80 and uh, they have clearly shown that you don't require this techno gizmos to to be able to combat the decision and uh, you know this techno determinism also prevents uh, looking for the simplest solutions and it distracts the attention onto something like uh, like aragya setu and sends um, the administrators on a wild goose chase so we have to be a little careful about these things and it also prevents understanding of a complex problem uh, which is you know i say that it is dimensions in physics biology sociology economics uh, epidemiology and in human uh, overall you know most of all in human compassion and i think this techno determinism comes in the way of developing a comprehensive understanding of, of the whole thing uh, i think i'll stop here and if there are questions then i'm happy to answer uh we have uttar going next uh she is going to share her presentation you can see her presentation down i'm expanding it uh you can also control the presentation box size but yes yeah. okay audible uh i think we, you are audible you're breaking here and there if it continues i'll let you know and you can turn off your video and just the audio continue okay great i'm just going to turn it off for a little bit the presentation and talk with it right? sure please do that yeah um okay hi everyone thanks to siddharth and professor banerji um it's a a good jumping off point for me uh so i am going to talk about surveillance and in india but i am going to take the conversation um a little further than uh, technology and the tech solutions that we're seeing and i'm going to try sort of contextualize this use of surveillance technology within a larger uh, socio political context and try and look at then what is surveillance technology could mean in that and i'm going to talk about these four aspects that that you can see and show how these aspects along with surveillance technology are a product of and often times aim in a uh, uh, aid in deepening authoritarian tendencies of uh, democratic governments and leaders it also i think it's important to say that the covid-19 pandemic has come at a time when india's democracy was already under th- and the ways in which we respond to this crisis the ways in which this crisis is handled uh, can further damage perhaps for the damage as democracy and leave impacts that will continue long after this crisis uh, a lot of theorists and writers have been writing about this uh, and therefore i think it's necessary that we sort of talk about this wider context even while we are in the midst of this crisis um okay so to to begin with why do we need to contextualize uh, the use of surveillance technologies and i argue that it's necessary uh, to do that so as to not address tech solutionism or tech determinism with technology we need to sort of expand the way in which we look at these problems and we also need to see how interrelated a lot of these issues are uh, so surveillance technology case is i argue part of a larger pattern that is impacting our rights and our democracies and contextualizing uh, these technologies can then help us deepen our conversation on rights uh, it can help us think more about holistic solutions when we see these various patterns that emerge and it can help us think more seriously about what a post covid world could or would look like uh, like shoshana zubov says when she talks about surveillance capitalism that this is not a story of technology but a story of institutions and therefore if we are to understand these institutions we have to contextualize them and if we are to understand this technology and the the sort of uh, atmosphere in which it emerges we also need to understand these technology uh, these institutions uh, so the first of the four aspects that i'm going to talk about which also relates 
of course, very directly to the COVID-19 crisis, is the, the rhetoric of war that is being used. Uh, this rhetoric is, of course, very evocative. It brings about feelings of patriotism, um, of duty. In many ways, it's a useful sort of metaphor to explain uh, the crisis. But on the other hand, it also breeds secrecy, uh, fear, and it, it, it requires us to pinpoint enemies. Uh, and I think that this can lead to a lack of accountability and transparency. So in a situation where you should be sharing clear information, where that information should be reflected by the various levels of government, what we are seeing is surprise announcements that might lead to panic that uh, has had much more serious consequences. And I'm afraid that this uh, lack of accountability will continue even after this crisis is over. So citizens will be left in the dark when questions are raised about why uh, the government was not more prepared, why resources were not consolidated between January and uh, late March. And it leaves a uh, little space for us to talk about this crisis for what it is. For one, it is a, f uh, a public health emergency. Uh, and another, it has shown serious failures in planning and governance. Another impact of using this kind of rhetoric is that governments are then keen on passing very dangerous laws. Uh, we are seeing this in a lot of other countries, uh, from Turkey to Hungary uh, to Israel. India tried to muzzle the press. Uh, luckily, the Supreme Court uh, stopped that from happening. And finally, this kind of rhetoric, I think, also lends itself to techno-solutionism. So the questions we are then asking are not what are our rights, but what are our weapons? Where is our enemy? How do we keep track of our enemy? Uh, related to this is the second aspect, which we have seen in this in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which is a police response. So in a lecture on the COVID-19 and the Indian economy, Professor Jayati Ghosh said that India has, from the very beginning, responded to this crisis as if it is a law and order problem rather than a public health problem. And such a response breeds a surveillance approach rather than a rights-based approach. What we have seen is uh, huge amounts of police violence, of course. And we have also seen that this kind of violence percolates down to the individual level. So we have seen uh, that healthcare workers and um, journalists have been attacked. Airline workers, healthcare staff, they have been either evicted or have been harassed in the places that they live. Um, and even before the Arogya Setu app was introduced, we were already seeing egregious breaches of privacy with the apps that were introduced for quarantining, with the release of personal information at the local level about who had been self-isolated. Um, so this kind of response, uh, and then what we see in these apps is about making the population more compliant, is about finding ways to control the population rather than uh, focusing on the fact that we need to address a public health issue. And I think that this is made even more evident, uh, like Siddharth pointed out, by the fact that public health experts and epidemiologists do not really seem to feature in the development of apps like the Arogya Setu. So what then uh, is really the purpose of the app is a question that I think emerges quite clearly. Um, I, the third aspect that I want to touch upon is the failure of institutions. Now, this is a pretty large uh, aspect, of course. So I'm going to talk only about a few things. The first one, of course, is that we still lack a uh, data protection law. And uh, this, the lack of this law is not because uh, data protection is emerging in this present crisis. Data protection has been a discussion and debate for a long time now. We have the grammar of what these laws might look like. We have ethical principles that have been drawn up. And countries across the world have legislated very seriously on what data protection and data privacy means. So India lacking a law is not because uh, not because these are uh, uh, not because such a, a law needn't exist. This law should have been introduced ideally a few years ago. There was already a draft, and yet it is not on the statutes. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about the behavior of the courts, even in uh, the present situation, I think all of us should be very worried if the chief justice of the country says, and I quote, that this is not a situation where declaration rights have as much priority or as much importance as in other times. 
uh, I think the opposite is true, given that this is a public health emergency that is showing the serious gaps we have in our health systems. This has to be treated as a declaration of rights. And whatever uh, ways in which we combat this emergency has to then be on the basis of rights. Uh, the next institution that I want to talk about a little bit is the news media. Uh, for a long time now, the news media has been problematic and disappointing. In the present scenario, we are seeing uh, that rather than uh, spreading verified information, it is spreading stigma, it is being encouraging Islamophobia, and of course, spreading misinformation. And I think all these various aspects point really to a lack of institutional trust. Um, having trust in a single individual is not institutional trust. I think this central power has uh, played a role in the erosion of our institutions. Uh, this centralization of power has left state governments and local governments sort of flailing without adequate resources to address a problem that is a ground level problem. Uh, so this lack of institutional trust is, of course, that we will build uh, over a long period of time. And in such a situation, having these kind of surveillance technologies being introduced does not necessarily uh, show institutional trust or help to build it. I think quite contrary is what we can expect to happen. Uh, the reason why we need strong institutions, especially at a time of crisis, is because uh, a pandemic like this is not actually a great equalizer. All of us are impacted by it. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but in any single people are always impacted the most. So if we have our institutions not competing uh, and not living up to their constitutional duties, we have a situation in which the vulnerable will be, much, uh, will be disproportionately impacted. Uh, and we have already seen that in the, the migrant crisis, in the deaths that have, uh, have occurred because of people trying to walk home hundreds of kilometers. So this really does uh, point to a failure of institutions. And this failure allows for two things. On the one hand, it's an overreach. And on the other hand, it also allows government to absolve its, its responsibilities. So this is a question that, that we need to talk about. And this is uh, a situation in which we need to then look at uh, the use of surveillance. Um, the last aspect that I want to talk about is that uh, this introduction of, of surveillance and this sort of dependence on technology is this, yeah. Um, this dependence on technology and uh, techno solutionism has not emerged with the COVID-19 crisis or with the ROK Setu app. Uh, for a long time, we have been seeing this, uh, this in Indian polity. Uh, I studied the Smart Cities mission. Between uh, 2015 to now, if you look quite clear at the documents that have emerged, we see that there is a much greater focus on uh, data and technology, wherein now smart necessarily means a smart. It necessarily means the introduction of information communications technologies, even at the cost of other infrastructure changes. Uh, we've also seen uh, the introduction, I mean, building of the national social registry, uh, quote unquote, during time, which uh, Kumar Srivastava describes as a single searchable Aadhaar seeded database or multiple inter databases that use Aadhaar and uh, sort of give a uh, throw light on various aspects of uh, private and personal information of a citizen in the region. Uh, based on uh, have read about the, the terms of service and the privacy policies that presently exist in our Setu app, it, we could well be looking at a situation where uh, this app also, I mean, the data from this app also becomes integrated into these larger data sets. Uh, Telangana Samagram system has managed to uh, bring about this kind of um, uh, sort of citizen data, uh, make it accessible to the state without even using Aadhaar. Increasingly, we are seeing law enforcement use facial recognition technologies. We have seen that during the anti-CAA protests that were ongoing. And again, all of this uh, exists in a situation with where we don't have a 
data protection law where we uh, do have a base on which we can then demand our right to privacy when it is uh, uh, w w when it has been um, sort of taken away by these various applications and technological interventions. So now come back a little to um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And, and I think that I want to say, like, say two things here. One is that it's true that this pandemic is unprecedented. It uh, requires very drastic responses. Um, and some of them need technological responses. And that's the second thing that I want to say, that technology could be very well an important tool. However, uh, if we are to start sacrificing our rights in these situations um in again what i want to say is should be a rights based response we are looking at a scenario from which we may not be able to come back uh rights that have been ceded privacy that has been ceded is not easily restored or rolled back so even if technology is an important tool and like the south for example that 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 is talked about uh what is also very necessary to mention in that text is that along with technology there was a um, much more thing that was going on there was um, a healthcare system that was much better equipped to deal with a situation like this than ours is furthermore uh, south korea is also dealing with the outcomes of not concentrating enough uh, on privacy uh, at the moment they are they are looking at uh, very presently at why they needed to have better privacy protocols in the applications and the technology that are uh, used. Uh, secondly, I think it's important to talk about who is also impacted most by the technology. Virginia Eubanks has written uh, about how technological tools, especially those aimed at surveillance and policing, always impact the poor the most. So as I am out of the town, we are looking at a situation where the Arogya Setu app might be forced upon people. And it will largely be forced upon not the privileged who can afford to continue to practice physical distancing, who can work from home, whose children can attend online class, private. This be for much more on those who need to work outside the house, who are daily wage workers, who live in much, uh, much more, uh, much greater proximity with one another, much more density don't have access to water to constantly wash their hands. So already we see that uh, that data mine that will take place has very clear class lines. Uh, also, we don't necessarily need the government to come and say you have to use this app. We in how people because of stigmatized, because of ostracization, because as a society we are well versed with division. Uh, we see that it's very easy for now buildings to come and say no you have you cannot enter to make it very yes you have an answer to uh, yeah. uh, communities to do similar things and of course this raises the question of the efficacy of the app itself in a population where most people don't have so, so already contact tracing is much more effective 50 percent of the population using here at the most we'll have about 30 percent of the population so why then are we into a technology that may not really solve the problem at hand? And this is to say nothing of the further divisions uh, and digital exist up across the and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that when we talk about these tech interventions, just so we have to worry about the purpose behind uh, these interventions and whether or not like Professor Banerjee about they will uh, be effective for the purpose in which they're being created. And most importantly, they then come at the cost of other vital in interventions. Are they at the moment? Is the Arogya Setu app coming at increasing capacity for hospital cases? Very important question that if we are to again look solely at surveillance we may not answer surveillance becomes an important um, sort of to which we questions be more of these uh, how 
then we sort of shift on this. Uh, as I said in the beginning, we are trying to contextualize this discussion in the first place. And very good play is ensuring privacy in these applications, in uh, saying that um, these applications have to be privacy first. They have to ensure the fundamental right to privacy is protected, and they have to be justified. Like every aspect of this, um, every aspect of this app has to be justified. Uh, so, like. Um, the IFF report draws out is there legality, proportionality, and are there safeguards? Is transparency and auditability of these apps? Uh, can people uh, help governments to find uh, various lacunae that might exist? Is there a sunset clause that says that once we are past this pandemic, we uh, will this app to our data that time? And I think as soon as Talking about pandemic in jets based lens, these might come if we don't know the beginning where this is some kind of uh, conflict that we look at, but this is a way in which we need to protect our population. Then we protect our population and their rights in many different ways, not only from this virus, but also. Outside of this crisis, institutions are still intact, our rights are still intact, our democracy still functions. Um, and beyond this kind of change, uh, beyond this conversation about privacy rights, are we also then talking about the right health care? Are we creating a situation wherein, if we say never again, we don't mean that we have the technology to surveil the population and ensure that the virus isn't spread? But instead, we have a healthcare system that can actually meet the needs of its population. We are guaranteeing economic rights both during and after crisis. An important way in which we can do this is what Ben Green calls tech goggles. And this need to, to sort of approach every problem and look for technological solutions. So maybe if we remove these tech goggles of ours, we can think of solutions that are contextualized that are inclusive and successful, but not these technology based solutions. Uh, and finally, I think as we uh, think think more about this crisis and what a post COVID-19 world would look like, it's necessary for us to now start thinking of what collective action might look like in a post COVID world. Uh, we, in, in India, we entered the COVID-19 uh, crisis in the midst of a number of public movements. We don't really see how those public movements can restart. And most likely, they will not for a long time. So we can inhibit and engender collective action and demand these rights that we can be for increased surveillance. And come to Shoshana's voice, I think in this we really need to bring certain epistemic inequalities that exist so that uh, information and knowledge become accessible so that the right to privacy is internalized as the fund. And I'm going to end there. Yeah. Uh, I guess we will be taking questions. Uh, if you have questions, please enter in the public chat and maybe we can tell people to do it themselves one by one. And I see there are a few people who have already asked questions uh, to Professor Banerjee. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, before you unmute yourself, just Ping your uh, names in the public chat so that I can call you out so that we could do it one after one and there is no complex audio complications. You can, you can just uh, put in me in there. 
and I'll just start allowing you call out your names and you can ask questions. Uh, hi Vijay, uh, can you unmute yourself, Vijay Ramanathan, and maybe you can uh, ask a question. Hello. Uh, yes. Professor Banerjee. So, having said that, more than 30 years has been spent in the academia uh, considering privacy to be one of the vital component. Why has there no push from I to ensure that our laws are consistent with the technology update that we are uh, looking through? Okay, so. Um... You know, there are, um, so I, uh, I I cannot answer for the community, but I've thought a great deal about this. And uh, I think till about five or 10 years back, um, computer science was not so much in public life. You know, the only public life use of computer science was probably restricted to databases, uh, you know, banking databases and so on and so forth. And it started coming to public life with web pages. And, um, and, uh, and certainly, you know, over the last five years or five, 10 years, there have been a plethora of uh, applications of bringing computer science to public life. You know, uh, and uh, and uh, this has been a deluge, you know, starting with things like uh, Aadhaar, digital identity systems, uh, things like um, payment systems, and uh, things like um, now contact tracing, you know, and I think that much of it uh, is related to smartphones and um, smartphone applications and uh, and stuff like that. Now, unfortunately, uh, you know, computer science applications or IT applications have come to the public life, but the rigor of computer science has been left behind. Uh, uh, and there's been a, a rush to roll out systems. And in many of these systems that are being rolled out, uh, you know, it is amazing that uh, there is an absolute disregard to existing literature uh, completely. And um, I think that the response to this has come from the legal community the most. You know, for example, in India, if you look at uh, it, has come from the legal community. Legal community has been most active uh, in their anti Aadhaar uh, activism uh, with the privacy judgment and so on and so forth. Uh, but in this conversation, the Technology has somehow taken a backseat, and uh, and it has not been easy to have a dialogue, you know, um, because uh, the languages of privacy uh, for computer science and law, and I've been trying to read up some of the uh, languages that are spoken in law, they're quite different, and the concerns are also quite different. So I see that the problem with uh, you know proportionality as Siddharth uh, mentions, uh, you know, in his in his talk, when you talk about uh, necessity or balancing or showing that this is the least intrusive um, intrusive thing, when you talk about those tests, um, you know, I I suspect that operationalization of those tests is going to be difficult. You know, in fact, I think that the operationalization in the Aadhaar judgment was pretty much random. Uh, uh, you know, both in the majority judgment and the dissenting judgment, I think that the operational, you know, the judges took some random views. So I think that uh, where computer science can play a big role is uh, trying to operationalize some of these definitions, you know, uh, and I think it is it is very, very essential. But that will require a lot of dialogue back and forth. Yeah. Uh, a quick follow-up so, uh, question. So uh, rather than putting incentive on the lawmaker, uh, there be regulations on the product that are rolled out by the uh, companies, by the government, so as to know uh, what kind of uh, products they are developing, what kind of impact that would have. Maybe that approach could be. I can understand that the language of the legal community and the academia don't particularly sync, but the companies do understand uh, academia, academia per se. I'm not so, sure. <laughs> uh. <laughs> You know, so I would say that there's some of those um, some of those applications that I've seen, especially from the government, are quite shocking. You know, uh, uh, EVM, Aadhaar, contact tracing, and I think that uh, in India there is also you know something uh, which I would like to call crony 
crony expertise that you <laughs> you certainly select a hand picked set of experts you know three experts maybe from three iits and uh, they certainly declare it safe now when you when you go to individuals uh, and when you go to institutions the response is completely different so if you came to me as an individual and asked for my opinion as an expert i am free to say pretty much what i think but if you came to my head of the department and ask for a departmental opinion then you know, that will be much more moderated you know we will be forced to do a much more um, an informed advice right so um, i think that picking up experts uh, is what is happening in india and that's a there's a certain amount of danger in that uh, so yeah thank you sir thank you uh riya yadav uh, can you unmute yourself and ask a question okay uh it seems like she may be having some issue but her question is essentially uh what's the view about kerala high court's latest judgment on sprinkler app is it inclusive of all that is needed to be done uh siddha do you want to answer that yeah i'll try my best uh, officially we, we, uh, iff internally is yet to formulate an official position on this we will be coming out with a position on the high court's order sometime early next week but the one of the big things that was circulating uh, as per my just quick perusal of the news was the fact that uh, the kerala high court in its order uh, 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 mandated that all data sets uh, data points which were shared with sprinkler are to be anonymized now that is an interesting point because it also correlates back to the arogya setu app as well which is there is a need to be able to figure out how to hold the, the uh, how to hold anonymization or audit anonymization or hold it accountable so for instance if there is a mandate that the center, uh, the state government in kerala must ensure that any data which is shared with sprinkler has been anonymized there is a need to create means for public aud auditability that that has, in fact has been administered by the uh, kerala government similarly in the arogya setu context uh if you look look at just the privacy policy uh, of the app it says that any data uh, data which has been anonymized and aggregated none of the privacy protections apply to those kind of data points and in fact there is no onus or requirement uh, on uh, the the government to even delete those uh, those data points now that we contend i would contend that it's uh, problematic because when you're trying to anonymize any and probably professor banerjee can also elaborate on this is that when you're collecting as many data points as the arogya setu app is and when you uh, uh, combine it with the fact that these anonymized data sets are linked to people's gps coordinates its reidentifiability is uh, according to literature that we've gone through is a lot higher and there are several information security risks so given that that is the case there is a need in the context of let's say something like arogya setu setu to be transparent as to how it's anonymizing the data set how will it ensure that it remains anonymized and the risk for reidentification is taken care of similarly there's a need to also figure out when a court makes such an order how do you operationalize something like this that is one of the things that our official response sometime early next week will address and we uh, iff will have a more concrete position on this sometime early next week and we will submit some substantive comments to the kerala government's committee which which uh, which is looking into the mat matter the two person panel that is invest uh, uh, studying the issue Um, can i come on anonymization a little bit uh, yes yeah. yes please so um, you know so uh, in computer science uh, you define uh, the notion of there's something called informational privacy and informational privacy is defined in the following way that uh, you say that the informational privacy is complete when whether uh, you have access to a statistical database or you don't have access to a statistical database doesn't 
make a difference to the amount of information you can figure out about me, right? So if you, with or without access, if you cannot figure out, then you say that um, you have complete informational privacy. And anonymization is a facet of informational privacy. So anonymization means that if I have access to the database with anonymized data, and if I don't have access, it doesn't make a difference. It's exactly the same. And then you say that it's completely anonymized. There is a theorem. There's a theoretical result by Cynthia Duo. It's a, it's a seminal paper where she has proved that informational privacy or anonymization is impossible under arbitrary auxiliary information. It's an impossibility result. So you say that if I have access to arbitrary auxiliary information, then any anonymization can be broken. Right? So a complete anonymization is a myth. And, uh, and this is a proven theorem uh, in a, in a, in a in a paper that has got probably over three to 5,000 citations. So the cavalier nature with which anonymization is talked about and uh, it's implemented in the IT sector is a bit surprising given, given this kind of theoretical results that exist. So, you know, I think that anybody who claims anonymization, the onus is on the designer to prove that the access to auxiliary information is bounded so that de-anonymization is not possible. So if you cannot establish that, the default assumption is that that anonymization can always be broken. And there has been in the last you know, five to 10 years, um, a deluge of papers that show that all kinds of anonymization can be broken, you know, um, none more uh, tellingly than from Irvin Narayanan in Princeton. So he has got a series of papers which shows that how anonymization can be can be bypassed so you know the people who are making these claims don't seem to be aware of the standard literature on anonymization now that is a state of affairs which is uh, not good in my opinion thank you sir because uh, oftentimes the phrase anonymization is sort of used as a get out of jail card to like try and do whatever without having to comply to certain informational privacy or privacy obligations and to be able to use it for different purposes and so on. Uh, okay, next question. Has IFF approached Google with these concerns, primary distribution channel for such apps and app stores? What's the responsibility do they have in curbing apps that they have such serious issues as pointed out by the panel like actually play store uh, responsibilities yeah so uh, at, at this stage what we're doing is given that apple and google will also have a fairly big role to play with respect to contact tracing and exposure notification once we update our working paper based on uh, public feedback early next week Aside from government stakeholders, we intend to share it with uh, Apple and Google representatives as well. So hopefully they can. Uh, uh, so hopefully they can also take cognizance of the various challenges with the issue. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Uh, then we have uh, Ray Rave, Can you try and mute yourself and ask a question? I think he's all in mode. Uh, so yeah, the question is: In case of our health data falls in hands of pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, in what all ways they can use harms uh, of data and data sharing? Do we know if government is actually sharing this data to anyone else? Uh, not not that we're aware of with respect to whether government is actively sharing it to these sort of actors. Of course, uh, private actors have helped the government build the Arogya Setu underlying system as well. But we've already seen previous, in given that we don't have a robust legal me mechanism like a data protection law that uh, Uttara was also talking about it during her presentation, uh, it becomes a lot harder uh, could someone mute their yeah thank you it becomes a lot harder to hold the government accountable with respect to 
uh, who they share the data uh, the, the data collected through the app with and for what purpose there is already certain references in the privacy policy with respect to the fact that it can share data with third party actors towards respond uh, towards responding to the medical health crisis that is going on right now so theoretically the government may have some scope to be able to share these underlying insights with these sort of companies but uh, id i i ideally uh, if one had a robust data protection law these sort of interactions could be uh, regulated by legal systems more robustly and transparently and I and just and just like one more point is secondary data markets are an issue uh, across domains so yeah it's particularly uh, problematic in the instance of uh, this kind of data but it's a problem in all kinds of uh, information and communication technology markets to be very frank and what is the core thing that you need is a data protection law as a first step uh okay we have a question from sharada mahesh sharada you can unmute yourself and ask a question now hi uh so my question was considering we don't have any legislation right now for you know data protection or anything uh if suppose it does come into effect say after uh it, uh, because of the covid surveillance or problem or whatever do you think this law can be do you think it should be prospective or retrospective and like if so why do you think it should be like for example if you think it's retrospective then say what would happen to the data that has already been collected uh, or prospective then what should they do see the the thing with the data protection law is and this is the reality of the situation is once it is actually passed it will take another 18 the way that the law has been designed and the fact that multiple regulations and institutions have to be set up for it to be operationalized even if the law is passed sometime in the middle of uh 2020 or towards the end of 2020 it will take another 18 months for that law to be operationalized the reality is we need what we need is a uh more specific legal framework to deal with contact tracing in the context of uh uh covid-19 and should it be uh, prospective or retroactive i think it should be uh, apply app- applicable to all data which has been let's say collected by a particular contact tracing app whether it's uh, before so there should be retroactive applicability i would argue uh because that way you can hold the entire system accountable if anything is not in conformity with let's say the new legal system if it is passed then you amend the systems accordingly to respond to the requirements that will that that can be one way to look at it researchers in the uk uh, lillian edwards for instance has talked about how there is uh, has come out have come out with like model legislations which can govern contact tracing apps whilst protecting people's privacy that is one of the things that we will be studying in our update to our working paper iff working paper uh also like other sort of alternatives are tools such as privacy impact assessments as well so for instance australia before it released its app a few days ago or maybe last week just in the last few days essentially they un- undertook a comprehensive data protection impact assessment so that's at least something to work towards to create some sort of checks and balances to the deployment of these systems right in india unfortunately it's very unfettered it's just like so the the sequencing in india has been on march 19th you start building the app and by april 2nd it's available for download and then after that just as you hear complaints you change tweak the privacy policy here and there and start adding new features to the app so that sort of emblematic of the fact that there is little uh, consideration for checks and balances and safeguards built into the design of the app and it also points towards the techno solutionism that both 
professor banerji and uttar have been talking uh, talking about in the lecture right now so i would say a data protection law even if it is passed does not really help maybe we need a covid 19 contact tracing specific legal system to be passed at the earliest so we need to seriously start thinking about that with the right kind of institutional oversight and so on okay i think one last final question from vijay uh, to uttara i think we are almost done and this uh, okay my question to ms uttara is that uh, given the nature that institutions crave power and technology gives them a upper hand in uh, becoming uh, overtly authoritarian so do you think that uh, technological perspectives or how Uh, technologies could be utilized by various stakeholders when any policy is uh, uh, being framed would be essential rather than having one particular bill which speaks entirely about data protection and as such because uh, as from mr what uh, sir banerji was saying it is not just confined uh, like before the past 10 years the technology would not come with the public domain but then it is now a deluge so do you think of one particular data uh, protection policy or act will solve all the problems which will come in the future or rather every policy should have an aspect of this uh, technological uh, impact that it would have uttara okay i think she is having some connectivity issues or maybe siddharth your opinion on this uh vijay could you just quickly just summarize the question one more time i lost oh. like bits of the question okay basically uh, given that uh, technology is going to be a vital part in the policy making perspective or in the public sphere and government institutions tend to take technology to become overtly authoritarian so yes. will one data protection law uh, cover entirely on this aspect or do you think that every policy perspective which comes henceforth should have some uh, restrictions on how the technology aspect is to be uh, misused by stakeholders see the thing is that ideally all government projects when they're using data or ict information communication technologies to respond to any sort of policy uh, challenge or objective should ideally adhere to fair information uh, practice principles the fipps they are fairly old they've been developed since 1974 in the us they were crystallized as privacy guidelines by the oecd and all modern data protection laws uh, data protection frameworks and government projects adhere to those principles the fipps now there are certain core aspects that uh, all these government projects must adhere to which is let's say purpose limitation collection limitation accountability for the government institutional oversight to ensure checks and balances so any government project even without a data protection law should benchmark itself against the fipps uh but what is what we view with even like for instance what government is doing with arogya setu is if you look at the terms of service it has a clear liability limitation clause which says that any error by the app including but not limited to four examples uh, or four specific conditions government will not be held li- uh, liable for any issues arising out of the app now that is problematic because that undercuts any degree of accountability the citizen can have with the government it does not create for a framework for legal remedy it does not uh, articulate that people have a legal remedy against the government at all within either the terms of service or the privacy policy then on top of that with respect to adherence to like limitation principles you can clearly see that for instance the limit the principles are vague enough for government to repurpose this project towards not just responding to covid-19 in its different uh, uh, dynamic ways but there is scope for and we must be alive to the risk that this project could be more permanent in nature and could be expanded or justified as something that is essential for other diseases as well in the future 
so which is why you need to be able to also hold the government accountable vis-a-vis -vis, you know sunset clauses and stuff like that so you, what you need is ideally your data protection law if you don't have that benchmark it against fipps and while you're benchmarking it urge or pressure government into coming out with either a, a legislation or a standard operating procedure which formalizes a system of accountability and that system of accountability should not reside within an institution within the executive but an in independent institution so it's a really difficult process I luckily the government has right now a committee which is studying different yeah. facets of what a citizen app is. So, and I think that is also yes. Sorry, Sorry. Uh, to interrupt you there. There is an addition to some of the statements just me make. What's stopping the government actually bring out those rules, right? Like we do have a right to privacy judgment, and so it, technically it's your fundamental right. We are waiting for this law and we are discussing about the law for years now, for at least three years now. But there is no uh, rule or like wh why aren't even the high courts uh, giving any orders based on the Supreme Court? Why is it that we continuously discuss this on and on? And why are there no orders or rules that in place? What's stopping the government to do it? Is it political will? Is it lack of resources? Uh, economy, Toby, it's all dead. So are we worried about the economy? What is it that is actually stopping the government to do it? I, th I think it's just been a, a function of, try for, from the government's perspective, it's trying to like create as many exemptions for the government to continue doing its day-to-day -day operations where the data protection law is passed, yet they aren't held accountable. So it fulfills certain objectives, which is, look, we've passed a data protection law to protect people's privacy, but the reality will be, it'll be stringent on companies whilst lacks on government. So it's essentially a negotiation also somewhere where businesses also try to like delay the passage of the law because you know, there are certain provisions that they don't want to be enacted in a hurried manner. So it's a combination of both. It's it's a combination of economic and political considerations, I would say. And right now, the thing is that when we're pushing for an, a quick passage of the law, we need to be saying that you need to pa pass it quickly, but also amend the fact that the government has carte blanche ex exemptions under the current bill, which has been referred to a parliamentary committee. So when you're advocating for speed, you have to advocate also for the fact that there are clear issues with the bill, because otherwise the government can just turn around and say, oh, you guys asked for a bill, we've passed a bill and it protects people's privacy. And that fulfills their optics of we've passed something, it's better than nothing, you know? So we need to be careful about those sort of advocacy initiatives, I would say. Thank you, Siddharth. Uh, yes, Professor Banerjee, but let's make it quick so that we end it and we don't want to make uh, take more time. Yeah, so, um, you know, um, so my guess is also that, uh, you know, the guidelines, whether it's in the data protection law or in GDPR, um, are not operational enough. Uh, so, for example, I'm sure that the Arab Setu developers are, have read the data protection bill, as I have. And... Uh, if you give the data protection bill to a budding engineer or the GDPR to a budding engineer, then he wouldn't know what to do. You know? So what are the what are the database development principles uh, that he has to invoke to be on the, uh, the right side of the law? So I think that the law is uh, too general and too vague for an engineer. You know, and this is not a criticism just of the data protection bill, but the but the entire discussion. So when you say fair and reasonable processing, you know, as a machine learning engineer, you don't know what does that statement mean, or you know, or if you even if you know, you don't know how to constrain yourself with that statement. Or when you say that purpose limitation, the question that will come to mind is what should I do to, to ensure purpose limitation? So I think that there has to be a lot more effort to operationalize many of these laws with examples and these operating principles must translate to technical guidelines and then it will be effective. 
So if I may just add one tiny uh, <laughs> point with respect to that, I apologize. But uh, so, for instance, one of the good things I think about the GDPR vis-a-vis what the Indian Bill does is it provides a lot of illustrations within, like, let's say, different parts of the law to at least create some sort of a picture of what it means by, let's say, purpose limitation. The challenge that law, the challenge when it comes to all of these laws is. at least in a country like india a lot of it is driven by lawyers and the 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 con- conversations with technologists sort of don't happen and that is a that is a failing i think in the way that consultations have been designed within india thus far so it, it's also a question of having like conversations such as the one we're having right now but at a larger scale with more lawyers and technologists and even sociologists and economists sitting together unfortunately right. that space is crowded out by, by lawyers and that is something that is sort of a failing of india's consultation processes i would argue which is why we have a computer science professor and a phd scholar uh, exactly <laughs> you are underrepresented in this space <laughs> right yeah. but thank you for making that out uh, we are going to end this call we are going to continue having more technical conversations hopefully on encryption anonymization uh not necessarily practicing practically just this i'm aware in there are too many technical terms that we are not discussing all of you have while we hope to get some of these discussing going on future without government consultation these are public talks hopefully uh, thank you all for joining and thank you that professor banerji uh, unfortunately had to quit uh, because of some network issues Uh, but we will soon get this video processed and uploaded on uh, and i'm going to end the the session here thank you all thank you thank you